Amen. So this morning, um, I have just a couple days left as a youth minister at Lakewood Church of Christ. Um, and in the next few days, it will actually be five full years that I've been blessed to be here. And in that time, I've had some amazing highs and some hard lows. In that time, I've gotten to see um, parents raise kids and send kids off. I've gotten to see kids grow up and move to college. I've gotten to see kids understand the love that God has for them. I've gotten to baptize so many kids here. I've gotten to work alongside you guys and seen the work that God has done here in Baytown and been able to be a part of it along with y'all. And you guys have, have helped me to grow, to learn how to be a better minister, how to be a better man, how to be a better Christian. You guys have given me grace. You guys have, uh, have forgiven me. You guys have, have helped me when I've messed up and I've gotten in over my head. You guys have supported our youth group. You guys have supported me and have loved me and have made this feel like home. And I'm so thankful for that. And unfortunately, I wish that there had been a better way for us to, to leave. I wish that there had been no quarantine where I could have hugged each and every one of you guys and told you guys that I've loved you guys and I will miss you guys. But unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, I had to do it over Zoom and over an announcement video. And it was hard. But the coronavirus has made a lot of things hard. We've had a, if you own a restaurant, you've had to figure out how to survive. If you're a teacher, you've had to figure out how to teach over a computer. And if you're a minister, it's no different. You've had to figure out how to continue ministering when you aren't able to be with people, which is so hard. And something that, that I did when the coronavirus started, I tried figuring out how we could continue to meet as a youth group because we wanted to continue studying and continue being together. So I very quickly decided that I wanted to have classes, but I didn't want to have classes on Wednesdays and Sundays, but instead on Tuesdays and Fridays. So every Tuesday and Friday, we have class in the afternoons where we'll have some fun together. We'll dive into God's word together. We'll pray together. And it's been a time that has been such a blessing to my life. And I hope that the kids have enjoyed it as well. And any of you parents that have joined in, I hope that you guys have enjoyed it. And you may be wondering and asking why I didn't have it on Wednesdays and Sundays. And a big part of that is that the youth group is not its own standalone thing. That I wanted the youth group to be a part of our church Zoom and our church Sunday morning worship on YouTube or Facebook. And I think that, that in this coronavirus where everyone's so alone and so separated, that I wanted these kids to spend time with their families worshiping and praising God on Sundays and Wednesdays. And I think it's been good. Our kids have been able to join in. And I hope that on Wednesdays when we have Zoom and you guys can see everyone's faces, you guys have seen our teens be involved. And they're sitting next to their parents worshiping and singing. I've loved seeing that. So we have done that. So we've had these Tuesdays and Friday classes. And at first, the classes that I decided to do was just a continuation of what I did pre-coronavirus. I believe we were going through James, and we were going to continue studying that. But very quickly, I realized that that's not what we needed anymore. So for the next few class times, we looked at um, things that, that we needed to hear. You know, how can we trust God in the middle of this virus? What are we supposed to do? How can we trust the power of prayer when this stuff is coming through and ravaging everything? And we looked at a few of those topics, and those are great. And then we switched gears a little bit. And I, and I had some of the kids start working and start being able to, to make sure that they could give lessons. That they knew how to do it. So we started going through that and training them up in that. But then I realized that I just had a few classes left. And I started thinking about what I wanted to teach, what I wanted to share. My last few classes as a youth minister here with these kids here that I have loved so much. What words would I leave them? What lessons should I share? And I realized that I did not have the wisdom on what words to say, that whenever I tried figuring out words that I wanted to share, I choked up 
and I couldn't think of them. So I decided to look in the Bible and see the words that people way wiser than me shared when they were going through transitions, when they were leaving and when they were passing the mantle to somebody else. So we started doing a last word series where we looked at basically the senior speeches of people in the Bible. And at this point, we've looked at at Moses. We saw his life and the things that he did and saw the wisdom that he gave to the Israelites and to Joshua as he passed on the mantle to them. And then we looked at Joshua and the life that he lived and the background of who he was. And then we saw the words of wisdom that he gave to the Israelites as he said that I will be leaving. And we have a few more people that we will look at as we go through the rest of the teen classes that I'm able to to be the teacher of. And today's lesson was what would have been my final lesson. But this is the this is the most important. I wanted to bring it into a sermon because I wanted to share with each of you guys because I think that Paul in his senior speech speaks so much to where my heart is as, as I go through this transition. And I think that the wisdom that he gives is things that I need to hear. And I want to let you in a little secret that whenever I preach or teach, that I do this study and I see what God says. And whenever I preach and teach, that I want you guys to learn and hear from. But the words and the lessons and the points that I teach are things that I need to hear as well. So whenever I preach these things, I'm not saying, you know, you guys are bad at it and you guys need to do this. But it's more, I need to hear this and I need to do this better. And I pray that those things are also things that you guys need to hear. So as we look at Paul, Paul is is, is a pretty interesting guy. He's a guy that, that knows a lot about God, but we know very little about his, his background. We know just a handful of things when Paul says, this is a little tidbit of, of who I am when he's talking to somebody else and he says, this is um, Paul of Tarsus. So we know Paul grew up in Tarsus. And we know what Tarsus was. Tarsus was, was one of the big uh, trade centers of that area. We can know what, what about that, that city, but about Paul, we don't know so much about his childhood. We know at some point that he became a student of Gamaliel. We know that Paul became a Pharisee. We know that Paul became not just a Pharisee, but he started rising through the ranks of Pharisees. He became very popular very quickly. And that's that's about it. We don't know much more about, about Paul's upbringing or childhood. In fact, the first place that we see him in the Bible is when he's an adult already. He is a, a pretty popular Pharisee. The first place that we actually see him is Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. Acts 7, 54 says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, he being Stephen, excuse me, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, grazed him to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. And he said, Behold, I see heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed him, rushed together at him. The Pharisees were rushing together at Stephen. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. This is the first place that we see Saul. Saul, who would become Paul was the, one of the big Pharisees. And when they killed Stephen, who the Bible describes as full of the Holy Spirit, Paul stood there approving of it. He was killing Christians. 
But we know the story of Saul who becomes Paul is that Saul goes and starts bringing Christians to the other Pharisees and they would be put on trial and he was basically bringing them to be punished and some to be killed. So Saul is going on one of these journeys and on this journey, God reveals himself to Saul and he blinds him and eventually Saul is able to see again and see clearer than he's ever seen before. And when he sees clearly, he sees that Jesus is Lord and that the guy that he has been persecuting is actually the Messiah that he has been waiting for. So Saul, in that moment, changes his name to Paul, and Paul becomes probably the greatest missionary that we've ever had. That the reason that Christianity spread so rapidly was because of the disciples, yes, but I think a huge part of it was Paul and the missionary journeys that he went on. Because after Paul becomes converted and becomes a Christian, he goes and starts spreading the gospel wherever he can go. And he ends up going on three missionary journeys where he goes and plants churches, where he goes and encourages churches, where he goes back home and he writes letters to those churches. He is spreading the gospel everywhere he goes as often as he can, even if it takes him being beaten, being stoned, because he is stoned and beaten and put in prison time and time again. But he gets out and he goes to the next city and he preaches and they stone him and beat him. But Paul is on fire for God. But while he is going around these missionary journeys, there's one city that is in particular very, very important to him. And it's this city of Ephesus. And he goes to several times. And he actually spends an extended period of time there. He writes a letter, which we call the Book of Ephesians. And these people have have a special place in the heart of Paul. And it is to these people that Paul says his senior speech. Because as he is finishing up these missionary journeys, Paul always had a desire to go to Rome. And not just Rome, but Spain beyond it. He wanted to go there more than anything. And as he was heading that way, he stopped in in near Ephesus and called the Ephesian elders. So turn with me to Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. And that's where we pick up on this story and where we hear the senior speech of Paul as he says goodbye to these people that he has worked with, that he has loved, that he has helped raise in faith. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17 says, Now for Milotus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And they came to him and then he said to to them, At this point, Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way. So he sends a letter to the the elders at Ephesus and says, Come, meet me on the way. So they are going to meet him. But Paul knows that as he goes to Jerusalem, that in Jerusalem he will be put on trial, that he will be going through trial after trial. And we can see about this in the rest of the book of Acts. Until ultimately when he is put on trial, he appeals to Caesar, which is very similar to if you appealed to, Uh, a court trial, and it keeps being pushed up and pushed up to the Supreme Court, except for this, it was immediately going to the Supreme Court. He appealed to Caesar, and because he was a Roman citizen, meant that they had to send him to Rome. They could not punish him. They could not touch him. They had to send him. So Paul knew that when he is in Jerusalem and he appeals to Caesar, they will send him to Rome with guards, and when he is in Rome, he will be put in prison. And in Rome, which we'll see about in the rest of Acts, He sits there and he continues to spread the gospel there. He teaches the people there. He writes letters that we have in our gospel, in our book, in our Bible. And Paul spends some time in Rome in prison and ultimately he dies there. So this is the last time that he talks to the Ephesian elders. And this is what he says. Um, Continuing in verse 18, And when the Ephesian elders came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plot of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of the repentance towards God, and of the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, 
And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, knowing not what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction awaits me. So he says, I am going to Jerusalem. He says, all that I have done here, he says, I have preached, I have done the work, I have done um, what I could. I have taught the good news to Jews, to Greeks. He says, this is what I have done, and you guys know what I have done here. He says, but now I'm going to Jerusalem. And this is what he says about going to Jerusalem. In verse 23, he says, that in every city that imprisonment and affliction awaits me. And in 24, he says, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul tells the story, he says, I have been with you guys. I have loved you guys. I have done God's work with you guys. He says, but now I have to go to Jerusalem. He says, I am going to Jerusalem because that is where God is calling me. And that when I go there, it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be with you guys that I absolutely love you guys. It's not going to be free of pain, but that everywhere I go, the Spirit tells me that I'm going to be in prison and beaten. He says, but I am going to go because God is calling me. And while that, that is not the point of today's sermon, I think that is something that we need to remember, that as Christians, we go to where God calls us. Whether that's somewhere that we're comfortable, somewhere that, that we know people at, or whether it's somewhere brand new, somewhere that God says, I need you to go here. As Christians, we need to have the mindset of Paul that we say, my life it means nothing. I will go and serve God. We see this when Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. And I think this is something that's so important, but something that is so hard because as people, we want to stay where it's comfortable, where we call home but God sometimes calls us somewhere else so he has said this is what I have done this is why I am leaving and then verse 25 we read a hard verse this is what Acts 20 25 says and now behold I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. So he says that this is what I have done. This is why I have to leave. And then he says, you guys won't see me again. So Paul is saying this speech and these people are hearing these words, knowing that Paul is going to leave. And Paul has left before, but he's come back. This time he won't. This is goodbye for real. For the rest of their lives. And, and I often ask my kids, and I may have asked you guys in sermons, but one of the big things I ask is, you know, think, how, how does this person feel? How, how do you think, how do you imagine this person would be going through this? And right now, I imagine with Paul that I can understand how he's feeling. I can understand the hurt, the pain, the joy in knowing that you're going where God is calling you, but the sorrow of leaving the people that you love. And maybe you guys know that feeling. Or maybe you know the feeling of being these Ephesian elders, of having someone that has spent so much time being your mentor in the faith, someone that has spent so much time loving you and being in your presence, and now that person is leaving. And it is after this that Paul gives us wisdom. And I think that he gives us five points of wisdom. And this isn't anything new. Paul isn't giving them some last minute, you know, this is one last thing I need to tell you, but instead I think Paul is saying, remember what I have taught you. Paul says, remember this. And the first thing that I think is that Paul tells them to remember the mission of God. In verses 26 and 27, it says, Therefore, I, Paul, testify to you 
this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Paul says that I am innocent of his blood. That Paul has done the work that he needs to do. He has gone through and preached and taught to the people there. And now not only has he done that, but that he has equipped the Ephesian elders and the Ephesian church to spread the good news of Christ. He has done the work and now he is passing on the work to them. He says, remember the mission of God. And I think that for us as people, that when we are going through transitions, when we lose a minister, a youth minister, when we move to a new city and we get plugged into a new church, when we go through whatever the transition may be, that the mission of God continues. That the mission of God is not dependent upon a person or a place, but that it is dependent upon us working and doing it. So, you know, as a youth minister leaves, the mission of God continues, and now it is your turn to help fill that. Especially as, as, a, minister, as a youth minister or minister leaves, there are holes that need to be filled. And it's a time where you say, I can help teach this class. I can help go to events. I can help do these things. Or, you know, if it is a church that is going to be moved and replanted, Remember the mission of God and say, you know, we are now in a new place. Now there's a new way to do missions, but the mission of God is still there. And we are still called to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul says, remember the mission of God. But then Paul also says, remember to be on your guard. In 2831, Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will men arise speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Paul says to be on your guard. And I think it's so important because when we go through transitions, whether it's going into college, whether it's being empty nesters for the first time, whether it's going forward after somebody passes away, in times of transitions, we are on, on unstable ground. There is a hole. When a minister or a youth minister leave, there is a hole and shaky ground that, that you guys have been taught, that, we have, that I have shared wisdom with you guys. And I say me, but it's for any trans transition that you go through. That they have shared wisdom with you. And when that person leaves, Satan has a hole that he can come through and tell you that this isn't true. That the world can say, you know, that's been nice, that's been fun, but it said this is better. So be on your guard because sometimes it can come from inside. Someone can come from the inside and say something that isn't true. But the truth of God isn't dependent upon who is preaching, who is the youth minister, but it is dependent upon the word of God that is this Bible. That if a youth minister or a teacher or an elder or anybody teaches you something that is not what God says in his Bible, that is not truth. And during times of transition, Satan will try so hard at that because you are sad, you are grieving, and you are just looking for any answer that will make it feel better. Make sure that you are on your guard and that your answer is coming from what God says, not just from what sounds pretty. So remember the mission of God. Remember to be on Guard. And in 32, we read the next one. In verse 32, it says, And now I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The third thing that Paul says is to remember the inheritance that God has given you. And this is important because we know that in this life, people are imperfect. The people that, that you love the most, that you think the highest of, will let you down. Not because they don't love you, because they don't 
care for you, but because they're humans. Things will let you down, will disappoint you. But the one thing that will never disappoint you is God. That regardless of what this world comes, that regardless of the transitions that you go through, the heartaches that come, that there is an inheritance that the world cannot take from us, and that is that we get to be in eternity with God and with his people. So Paul says to remember the inheritance that God has given you. Um, there, there was a, a camp that we went to a couple years ago. And as we were fixing to leave, this, the, the speaker said, you know what? I hope that we can see you guys next year. We can see you guys at some point again. He says, but if not, he says, we'll have a party when we get to heaven. He says, our party will be the big people cheering like weirdos to the right of the pearly gates. And I think that that was such a beautiful thought that they remember if we don't see each other's faces in this life again, as Paul here knows that they will not see his face. He says, remember the inheritance that God has given you something greater, but that when we get there together, we will see each other once again. And that's something that I want to tell you guys that I, I hope that I'm able to come back and that I want to see your faces again. But if for some reason we are not able to, when we get to heaven, we'll be that party to the right of the pearly gates. We will be celebrating and cheering that we are in God's presence, that we will be getting to worship him together with not just the believers here, like, but with the believers of all time, of all places. And we get to say hallelujah to the king of kings. So Paul says, remember the inheritance that God has given you. And his fourth point, which is in verse 33 to 35 of Acts 20, he says, I coveted no one's gold, or silver, or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he handled himself and said, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The fourth thing that Paul says is just remember to take care of each other, especially the weak. That in times of transitions, as I mentioned during Be On Your Guard, we are on shaking ground and Satan has a way to come in. He has an opening and he can do some damage. But the fourth point is that Paul says to remember to take care of each other, especially the weak ones. Because as a body of Christ, during transitions, we draw together and we help each other. Whether that is a transition of somebody has passed away or a youth minister leaves. Or someone is into a new phase of life. Someone's going to college and they are going away from mom and dad and they don't know how to do it, what to do. As Christians, we are called to help one another. Whether that is physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, we are called to help one another. Not just those that can help us back. We don't just help the person that, you know, they'll, they'll help me back when I need it. But we help the ones that can't because we love them, because we care for them. And in a transition like this where a youth minister is leaving, make sure you take care of the youth group. That while I have been blessed to be a minister to all of you guys, I have unfortunately, I was not it's not unfortunately, I have been blessed to spend a lot of it with these kids. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to spend a lot more with you guys. But I have loved these kids. These kids are amazing and wonderful, and they are so godly, and they love God so much. And a youth minister leaving is going to hit them a lot more. Make sure you reach out to them and see what needs to be done. Ask how they're doing. Sit with them when we get back into church together and sing with them. Ask what songs they want to sing and try to have those songs put in so that they can sing, so that they can still feel connected that other people are loving them because one mentor is leaving but thankfully we have a church full of mentors that can step in and say i will be here with you take them out for ice cream go and join whatever silly activities they have go sit in classes with them but take care of each other especially the weak and when i say weak i don't mean someone who's actually weak but i mean those that are in more need and the last point, I think that this is the point that I think a lot of us need to hear. In Acts 36, through the end of the chapter, and going all the way into 21 and verse 1, 
it says, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word that he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to his ship. And in chapter 21 and verse 1 it says, And when we had parted from them and set sail. The ESV says that when we had parted with them, but I like the NIV version a little bit more. The NIV version in 21 verse 1 says, When we had torn ourselves away from them. And I think that that is a good word for it. But Paul said, Remember the mission of God. Remember the inheritance that God has given us. Remember to be on your guard. Remember to take care of one another, especially the weak. And then he says, remember that it's okay to grieve, but we must keep moving forward. As people that go through transition, whether it's a loss of someone, whether it's um, someone moving away, whether it's going to a new phase of life where we have, uh, all of our kids have left the home or we're going to college for the first time or we're going into high school. It's okay to grieve the things that we have lost, the things that were. And, you know, who knows how long that grief takes. And I think part of it is that there is always a little bit of grief. Especially when you lose someone, when you lose a child or a parent or another family member. That grief is always just a little bit there. And I think this grief is something that Paul shows that it is okay to be sad. It is okay to be sorrowful. It is okay to have these feelings and to cry together. But we must keep moving forward. We can't go back to the way things were because there is now a new normal. There is something new that we have to learn how to be. Um, this is very, um, very similar to if you have been married for a long time and somebody loses a spouse, they have to figure out a new normal. It's very, it's very normal for, for couples that have been married for a long time and one of them passes away for the other one to try to figure out how to do stuff. Because maybe for years they've had their spouse that would pump their gas for them and now they have to literally remember how to do it again. There is a new normal and that grief stays, but we have to continue moving forward. We have to walk in the future and know that God is walking with us. And I think that in 21 and 1, the NIV version is where it says that we have torn ourselves from them. Because I don't think it is easy to go through transitions. And I think Paul and everyone in the Bible that goes through transitions knows that they are hard. But it's something that happens. So we grieve and cry and know these feelings are okay. And these are feelings that God, that Jesus, when he was on earth, felt himself. He cried when Lazarus died. He cried before he went to the cross. But we keep moving forward. Even if it's one slow step, we move forward. But the beauty of it is that God is going with us forward and God will take care of us as we go forward. Paul has given us these five pieces of wisdom He says, once again, to remember the mission of God. Remember to be on God. Remember the inheritance that God has given us. Remember to take care of one another, especially the weak. And remember that it's okay to grieve. But we must keep moving forward. And I pray that you guys remember these words, this wisdom that Paul gives you as we go through the transition of me leaving. And I pray that I remember these words as I go through the transition of leaving you guys because that is not something that is easy. It's something that is hard. Something that my heart breaks daily. But I'm so excited for the work that God will do for me where I am going and for you guys as you guys continue to do the work here. God is faithful and he will bring good things He will continue to bless the works that we are doing. I thank you guys for for these five amazing years. 
I thank you guys for being workers. Workers that served God with me. I pray the Lord bless you guys. I pray that I'm able to see your face again on this earth. But if not, remember that when we get to heaven, we'll be having a huge party to the right of the pearly gates. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are a good God, that you are still a good God in light of transitions, in light of hard times, in light of, in light of viruses. You are still good and that you are greater than all of those things. Lord, I ask that you be with this body here at Lakewood and the transition that they're going to go through, Lord. And I ask that you help them to remember the words of Paul. And Lord, I ask that you bless them. Bless the work that they will do after I leave. Bless whoever works with them. Bless the city of Baytown. And I ask that you multiply it, that you help Lakewood to grow in the souls that they will be saving. Lord, I am so excited to celebrate all of the work that they will be doing. Lord, I ask that you be with me, and I ask that you help me through my transition. I ask that you make it a blessing. Lord, it's because your son's name we pray. Amen. If you guys need anything, if you guys are struggling with this grief, and you guys are needing someone to help you, as our fourth point said, or if you guys have never experienced his inheritance that God says through going through the waters of baptism, we can help you with that. Or if you guys have been baptized and you guys don't know how to remember the mission of God, we can help you with that. Let one of us church members, let me, let Josh, let the elders know, and we can help you. Grace and peace be with you guys.